Throughout its 70 plus year history, the NASCAR Cup Series has raced at nearly 200 unique tracks. And if recent trends continue, we'll push far past that in the coming years. But let's be honest here, most tracks NASCAR has visited over the decades were either mediocre or outright terrible. I mean, there's probably a damn good reason why we don't race at them anymore. However, a select few are absolute hits and have found a nice home for themselves on the schedule. And even if we don't race at them anymore, they're looked back on fondly. Some of these tracks were absolute bangers right from the word go, while others have had to fight and claw their way to adoration. And some have even had their life's work misunderstood in recent years. Whatever the case may be, here's my top 10 list of the best tracks to have ever hosted a NASCAR Cup race. There are only two criteria. One, the track must have hosted the top level of NASCAR competition at least once. And two, the track must have a fairly uniform history of good, compelling racing. A few bad years recently will not erase dozens of good years in the past. And likewise, a few good recent years will not override decades of poor racing prior. So with all that out of the way, let's get down to business. Number 10, Pocono Raceway. Okay, I can already hear some people groaning about this pick down in the comments, so let me make my case first. I put Pocono on this list because it's one of the most unique venues NASCAR goes to. It's a two and a half mile super speedway with relatively flat banking and sharp turns that has been wildly misunderstood by NASCAR fans as of late. The point of Pocono, as well as Indianapolis, you could argue, is not to have insane side-by-side -side shootouts lap after lap, but to test man and machine and push them to their absolute limits. We forget now, but that was the whole point of auto racing from the very beginning. And here we have a track that still does just that, a real rarity nowadays. Pocono boasts the longest straightaway in all of NASCAR, but also has some of the sharpest and lowest banked turns, causing drivers to slam on the brakes hard and even downshift, something they normally only do on road courses. This strain on equipment means that these races are more wards of attrition than anything else. And as such, these races tend to be real tests of skill and allow for drivers who might not have the best equipment to rise to the top. Not to mention that even with the advent of stage racing, Pocono still has fuel mileage play a big factor, something that has become all but lost in recent years. Sure, Pocono races aren't barn burners, but they were never supposed to be. They were supposed to be more about strategy, and I think many people have lost sight of that. But if you want the cream to rise to the top and not let gimmicks or money determine the winner, then this track is your cup of tea. Plus, the party scene at the Pocono campgrounds is insane. It's on my bucket list for sure. Number 9, Bowman Gray Stadium. Yeah, I'm a bit biased here and this track stands in stark contrast to Pocono, but the quarter mile bull ring built around a football field is one of the best venues for Saturday night short track racing in America. Affectionately nicknamed the Madhouse, Bowman Gray has a tendency to bring out the worst in drivers and lead to some outright chaos on the track. With nowhere to run and nowhere to hide, this tight little track always produces a must watch show. And yeah, it might be a glorified demolition derby, but we need that every once in a while. NASCAR has always been about racing in all of its forms, whether it's being focused on strategy, straight up speed, attrition, or just slugging it out like a bunch of rats trapped in an outhouse. And Bowman Gray fulfills that latter category perfectly. It has hosted 29 races in the Cup Series from 1958 to 1971, and in the 2010s, it found a nice home for itself in the Arca East and Southern Modified Series. And you would be hard pressed to find one snoozer of a race in its repertoire. Events here always leave the crowd with lots to talk about on the drive home, and nowadays NASCAR needs that more than ever. The 17,000 seats at Bowman Gray might be too few to attract NASCAR today, but its spirit lives on as NASCAR hosted the preseason Bush Clash at the LA Coliseum earlier this year to much fanfare. Number 8, the Nashville Fairgrounds. Built in 1903, the Nashville Fairgrounds isn't just one of the oldest tracks in NASCAR, but it's one of the oldest in the world. From 1958 to 1984, it played host to 42 races in NASCAR's top division, as well as hosting the very first televised night race in NASCAR history, a mainstay of NASCAR scheduling these days. The 5 eighths of a mile short track has had a few different reconfigurations with its banking, at one point having the highest banking on the circuit, but today it's 18 degrees in the corners make it an exceptionally fast short track, and a big draw for late model racers all over the country. Despite being known as a prime example of short track racing, Nashville is not a one-groove track and offers multiple ways to get around opposing drivers other than just using the chrome horn. Although the Cup Series stopped racing here in the 80s, the Xfinity Series raced here clear into the 90s, and in recent years, NASCAR has hinted at coming back and proposed massive upgrades to the track. Being right smack dab in the middle of downtown Nashville, a booming sports market, the project is moving along pretty well and is all but done. So hopefully Nashville will make its triumphant return in the next few years. Number seven, Charlotte Motor Speedway. Built in 1960 by none other than Curtis Turner, Hail to the King, baby! Charlotte Motor Speedway continues the long tradition of motor racing in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. Formerly home to the three-quarter of a mile dirt track that held the very first NASCAR Cup race ever, as well as a massive high-banked wooden board track in the 1920s, Charlotte was an obvious sight to plop down a big mile-and-a-half super speedway. The track is a tough one to navigate as its front stretch is wider than the turns, so drivers have to negotiate a bottleneck going into turn one. 
Before its recent repave, the track was known for its massive bumps along the backstretch before going into turn three, meaning that drivers had their hands full all the way around the track. These bumps were affectionately nicknamed Humpy's Bumps in honor of the track president back then, Humpy Wheeler. Charlotte is also home to the lone endurance race on the schedule, the Coca-Cola 600, which takes the green flag just a few hours after the Indy 500, and is on the same day as the Formula One Monaco Grand Prix. These three marquee events comprise the greatest day in auto racing, and if that isn't enough to get Charlotte in the top 10, then take this into consideration. Charlotte doesn't just give us one track, but two. We still haven't talked about the Roval. In 2018, the Fall Charlotte race was held on the infield road course, not the Oval. And I have to say, being there in person, it was one damned fun and memorable event. I can't say I've ever been that enthralled by a NASCAR race ever before or since. It took what was a by-the-book forgettable race and turned it into must-watch TV. Can't say that about too many other tracks. Number 6, Hickory Motor Speedway. I will contend that there is no greater example of classic bullring short track racing in America than Hickory Motor Speedway in North Carolina. Having hosted 35 races in NASCAR's top division from 1953 all the way to 1971, Hickory underwent three different reconfigurations during this time. Initially, it was a half-mile dirt track, then became a four-tenths of a mile track, still dirt, and was finally paved in 1967 and had its length reduced to three-eighths of a mile, a configuration it still keeps today. NASCAR raced on all three versions, and no matter what the track looked like, it always put on a show. The tiny track is asymmetrical with 14 degree banks in turns 1 and 2 and 12 degrees in turns 3 and 4, meaning that drivers are constantly having to adjust to the track and any advantage gained in 1 and 2 will be lost in 3 and 4 and vice versa. Not to mention the straightaways are anything but straight. You're constantly turning the wheel and you never get any chance to just relax and breathe. You're constantly working at it. This leads to some crazy moments and some serious temper tantrums. It is not at all uncommon to see at least one person escorted out of the venue by police on any given night. Although the Cup Series stopped coming here in 1971, the Xfinity Series came here all the way until 1998, and for a while it was the series finale, leading to many harrowing moments like in 1992 where Joe Nemechek was involved in three separate wrecks but still managed to battle back and narrowly take the championship. If this old girl were to be upgraded and put back on the schedule, I think the final race of the season would be a fitting home for her. Number 5, Talladega Super Speedway. Yeah, yeah, I know I put this track on my top 10 worst tracks list, but I, like most of the drivers who have raced here, have a love-hate relationship with it. One part of me sees the dangerous 200 mile an hour demolition derby as a major safety concern and a massive money pit. But the other part of me sees the close side-by-side -side racing and death-defying blocks and can't help but smile. And I really can't call the outcome of Talladega races a crapshoot either, because the same guys keep winning. Brad Keselowski has practically made the place his home away from home, and I'm pretty sure the Earnhardts actually own the keys to the joint. Yeah, it does have its fair share of undeserving underdog and one-off winners, but I guess I could say that about most of the tracks on this list. It's the biggest, baddest track on the schedule and has been since day one. It has an aura surrounding it that no other track can match. And on top of the spectacular racing, it has hands down the craziest infield party scene of any racetrack. I'm surprised half the state of Alabama doesn't end up in jail by the end of the race week. It's absolute anarchy down there. The only thing stopping it from being higher on this list are all the things I mentioned in my Worst Tracks video. Talladega is a venue of dualities. I love it and I loathe it, but I'll be damned if I don't go out of my way and stop everything I'm doing once race day at Talladega comes around. Number 4, Road America. In 2021, many were surprised to learn that the Cup Series race that year at Road America was not the first race they had ever held at that historic road course. It was actually the second. In 1956, NASCAR made the first trip up to Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin, and Tim Flock took the trophy. However, in the meantime, the Xfinity Series had put on some amazing races there, and the Cup Series followed them some time later. Having been to that 2021 race in person, I can say the atmosphere of the track and the product on the road were incredible. Half of the track is campsites and the normal fare you'd come to expect from a major American road course, but the other half is basically a nature trail that just so happens to have a racetrack running next to it. And the kink on the back half of the track plays host to some of the most exhilarating moves ever attempted in a NASCAR stock car. With cars being flat out at the bend of the track with the sound of the engines bouncing off the trees and coming back at you, it's one of the loudest spots on any track. And the kink isn't the only corner with a memorable name. There's the Carousel, Canada Corner, the Kettle Bottoms, and probably a few others I'm forgetting about. I've clocked hundreds of laps at this track in Forza Motorsports, so I've got a greater appreciation of it than most. But one thing that sets Road America apart from its counterparts is its season pass program. At the race in 2021, I talked to dozens of people who had never been to a NASCAR race, but simply had season passes at the track and attended just to see what the deal was. And I'd bet that all of them fell in love with the series that weekend. I gotta say that four mile road course is one of a kind. Number three, Martinsville Speedway. 
Hickory might be a classic example of bullring racing, but Martinsville is that perfected to an extent not thought possible. The Paperclip, as it's known, is a half mile short track that has been described as two quarter mile drag racing strips with a U-turn at each end. And that's a pretty accurate assessment. The track simply lends itself to dive bombing the corners to make daring passes, and there's nowhere to hide either. With no runoff room and walls close by on either side, if you have a problem in Martinsville, it quickly becomes everybody else's problem. And the track has become known for hours long slugfests where drivers will literally hunt each other down to do as much damage as possible. This animosity usually has championship implications too, as everybody remembers when somebody did them dirty at Martinsville. Martinsville is not a fast track, so it's 400 and 500 lap races or long slogs where most drivers just hope to survive. And the true mark of having a good day at the track is to finish with a car that doesn't have any bent sheet metal on it. However, the list of winners at the paperclip reads like a list of legends. Richard Petty, Darrell Waltrip, Rusty Wallace, Jeff Gore, and Jimmy Johnson, all of those guys are easy Hall of Famers, which is just what I'd expect from a track that's been on the schedule since day one back in 1949. All of that, and I haven't even mentioned the constantly sold out campgrounds and the famous $2 Martinsville hot dog. Yeah, it's a blast from the past and every single race fan is glad it's still alive and kicking. Number two, Darlington Raceway. Call me biased all you want, but my home state track of Darlington Raceway is clearly one of the best tracks on the schedule. Whether we're talking about the most dominating run in NASCAR history where Ned Jarrett won by 14 laps, or the closest finish in NASCAR history between Kurt Busch and Ricky Craven, Darlington seems to always lend itself to unforgettable moments. And its construction might have something to do with that. The one on a third mile speedway is actually pinched down in turns three and four, because of a minnow pond the track constructor Harold Brasington couldn't buy when he built the place back in 1950. So the asymmetric track is a real challenge for drivers when combined with its ultra-narrow racing groove. The tight strip of higher banked asphalt near the wall was originally a safety feature to help drivers scrub off speed before they hit the wall, but guys just started using it as the main racing groove and it made them drastically faster, so it has remained the preferred racing line ever since. The Southern 500 on Labor Day weekend is a tough, long race that requires drivers to manage their equipment while also fighting off other drivers and the track itself. The Darlington Stripe is something that everybody earns at one point or another, and it's in reference to running too hard and scraping the wall, leaving a black stripe from your tires along the wall where you made your mistake. Many believe that it's also where the nickname of the track is derived from, the Lady in Black. But that originally came from the 1960s, where track operators would put down a layer of black sealer on the track weeks before the race, in order to attempt to make the track grippier. In reality, though, it just made it slicker and more treacherous, much to the adoration of the tens of thousands in attendance. Darlington is also home to the fan-favorite throwback race in spring, where drivers break out retro paint jobs for cars from the past. With so much history and great racing year in and year out, Darlington is going to remain a mainstay of NASCAR racing for a long, long time. Number 1. Bristol Motor Speedway the last Coliseum can be found not in Rome, but in the hills of Bristol, Tennessee. This half mile high banked oval started off as a flat track, but upgrades over the years made its banks as high as any super speedway, at one point topping out at a staggering 36 degrees. It was a real hit with locals, but struggled to find an audience outside of the mountains. That was until they started hosting its summer race at night. That made the mayhem of Bristol come alive and captured the imaginations of every NASCAR fan in the country. In 1991, they paved the track with concrete, really making the cars pop out on the TV screen. And by the late 90s, the track was totally enclosed with wraparound grandstands that held 168,000 people at a time. But what made this place so electric? Well, besides the high speeds, Bristol was a one-groove track for most of its existence. If you wanted to pass someone, they either had to give you the spot or you just had to punt them out of the way. And coming to the checkered flag, nobody is just going to hand you the spot. So Bristol became synonymous with the bump and run, a tactic loved and hated by NASCAR fans depending on which end of the deal your favorite driver was on. Since I was five years old, I have not missed a single Bristol night race, either being in person or watching it on TV. I make damn sure to catch this one when it comes around in late summer, and millions of other people do too. The track has been reconfigured to allow multiple groups of racing nowadays, but as it's aged, the good old fashioned beating and banging action has returned, and this track is still an absolute fan favorite and will be for decades to come. It's a staple of every NASCAR highlight reel and for damn good reason. It's Bristol, baby. Oh, and did I mention it can also host dirt races? Yeah, in 2021, it held the very first dirt race in NASCAR Cup Series competition since 1970. Bristol can just about do it all. So that about does it. My top 10 list of the best tracks to have ever hosted the NASCAR Cup Series. Agree? Disagree? Tell me what you think. Anyway, I'm Slapshoes. Thanks for watching. And until next time, y'all take it easy.